HRC, HRC, HRC. Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, church. Peace be upon you all. Happy Sabbath day and welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Kasafo. And I'm your brother, Zakwa. We hope you all enjoying the day. We thank you all for taking the time to spend some time with us today and continue or join us in this edification for building family relationships. Today, we're going to be talking about the dynamics of parent-child relationships these things are essential and it's a good next step in learning after the things we've been talking about. Uh, Brother Zachary, you got anything before we get going here? Um, just really going into the scriptures and understanding how each relationship is to be handled, I think is very important. So um, I hope everybody gains something from it. And really gets to um, start utilizing it in your own um, environments and families. Amen. Amen. With that, let's jump into the dynamics of parent-child relationships. And let's start with the parent-daughter relationships. Can you start at Sirach or the book of Ecclesiasticus if you have the Apocrypha? Sirach chapter 3, verse 1, please. Hear me, your father, O children, and do thereafter that ye may be safe. So this is for sons and daughters, as he's speaking to the children. Continue, please. For the Lord hath given the father honor over the children, and hath confirmed the authority of the mother over the sons. Daughters. Your father has honor over the children all their days, and he is there to instruct you from your youth to prepare you for adulthood. Can you read Sirach 7 and 23 and 24, please? Hast thou children, instruct them, and bow down their neck from their youth. Hast thou daughters, have a care of their body, and show not thyself cheerful toward them. Remember, He's watching out for your body to keep you from harmful environments and will hold you accountable for your benefit, not overlooking opportunities to teach you the right way to go when you stumble or are ignorant to a matter. He's preparing you to be a virtuous woman, and if Allah wills it, he'll give you in marriage to a man of understanding when the time comes, or he'll keep you as unmarried to serve the Lord in your chastity. Can you read first? Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34, please. That's a, I got something. This is ah. this is one of those, uh, you good. This is one of those essential moments where a, a father can make the mistake to raise his daughter to serve himself and not raise his daughter to actually serve Allah and prepare her to be with a husband. That's that essential moment in raising your child where it's pivotal. Because if I look upon my daughter and I'm raising my daughter to pretty much be in a relationship with me and I'm not making her go by the standard of Allah and I'm raising her according to my standard and, and my own liking, then I'm I'm the one in the wrong. But if I'm actually preparing her for marriage and, and establishing the standard of Allah upon her, then I'm preparing her for whatever Allah sees to utilize her in, whether it is to give her to a husband or for her to remain single in her chastity. I'm preparing her either way. So this is where it really becomes a, a very, very important moment. And it's very important for the fathers 
to be that because you're her first male relationship physical male relationship so the way that you treat her the way that you speak to her the way that you teach her or you guide her is going to be what she knows in her life so if you're raising her with no accountability and you're justifying everything that she does then that's what you're raising her to be and that's the person you're raising her to be so it's very, very important for the fathers, and especially in their daughters' lives. I'm finished, Cotton. Thank you. That's essential. That's great. Can you read First Corinthians chapter seven, verse thirty-four, please? There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, as she may please her husband. You see, if that daughter can't maintain her chastity and has a desire for her husband, give her unto a man of understanding that keeps the law. Can you read 1 Corinthians 7 and 9, please? But if they cannot contain let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Amen. Sirach 7 and 25, please. Marry thy daughter, and so shalt thou have performed a weighty matter, but give her to a man of understanding. When a daughter is married, the father will bless you and your husband, his son-in-law, and he'll encourage you to do well and do well unto your new parents, too, so he may rejoice in your well-doing. Can you read Tobit chapter 10, verse 10 to 12, so we can see how it goes when a father is given his daughter in marriage? Please. Uh -huh. Then Ragul arose and gave him Sarah his wife, and half his goods, servants, and cattle, and money. And he blessed them and sent them away, saying, the Elohim of heaven give you a prosperous journey, my children. And he said to his daughter, Honor thy father and thy mother-in-law, which are now thy parents, that I may hear good report of thee. And he kissed her. You see here, a father doesn't hold on to his daughter when she's married, though he still cares for his daughter, along the lines of what you were talking about, Zach, or how he prepared her for that. He didn't prepare her for himself, so... He isn't attached to her in that sense. It's not right for a father to cling to his daughter, hindering her relationship with her husband, as the man did unto the Levite, not encouraging his daughter to do right by her husband because he wanted her there with him in Judges 19 and 20. As you may re recall, we discussed in the lesson, The Foundations for the Family. When that time comes for her to be married, a father still cares for her, but in a way that he hopes she's doing well and being treated well. Your father and the Lord cares for you all your life at every stage. Sirach 42 and 9, please. Father waketh for the daughter when no man knoweth, and the care for her taketh away sleep. So this helps understand how he has a care for her body, making sure she is safe. Continue, please. When she is young, lest she pass away the flower of her age. He cares that she gets married when she's at a marriageable age to bring forth grandchildren and not to have her beauty wasted away by an estranged heart despising men or not one to get married in a hatred for men. 42 and 10, please. In her virginity, lest she should be defiled and gotten with child in her father's house. That's where he watches over her body, protecting her from someone taking advantage of her, or if she has trouble with fornication, having a desire for a husband to marry her off so that she doesn't embarrass him in the city, committing fornication or getting pregnant in his house. That's how you perform a weighty matter, as Sirach 7 and 25 says. Zachary exactly explained that. Can you read Sirach 42 and 11, please? 
keep a short watch over a shameless daughter, that she make thee a laughing stock to thy enemies, and a byword in the city, and a reproach among the people, and make thee ashamed before the multitude. It's important, fathers, because we have to stand before Allah and his angels in a judgment, and we don't want to be ashamed before them because we didn't do what he said to do in his commandments. If you don't have anything, continue Surah 42 and 10 to read the rest of it, please. And having an husband, at least she should misbehave herself. He cares for her to behave herself well, as he taught her growing up. Can you read Psalms 32 and 8, please? I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. This is our job as parents, to teach the daughter the standard of Yache and nurture them in it all their days, admonishing and correcting them to make their way straight. Continue, please. And we're going back to the rest of Sirach 42 and 10. I thought that was interesting. He said, I will guide thee with my eye. It was like, interesting. Everything <laughs> that he sees that she's doing. Right. <laughs> Everything that he sees that she's doing wrong or if he even sees like like for me, when I see like something that's beyond um the physical, then I will sit down and speak to her about it so that she can understand so that Allah I am willing I can get to it before it actually um manifests itself in her actions you know if i see something very small i'll be like okay hey let's talk about this and it gives me understanding of something that i can't have a conversation with her about so it's interesting to say i would guide thee with my eye like interesting i definitely glad i shouldn't think you to discuss that because he said the father keepers a watch over his daughter and he's talking about guiding with the eye showing the attentiveness to detail we as parents have to be paying attention to for our young ones. And you touched on, it was something that you seen before it became something. And Hermas, when he said, when righteous discourse daily avails much or it helps overcome. I remember the parable the angel used was that as a smith with his hammer when you're chiseling at something, there's little pieces that you're catching and getting rid of to help form the image that you're trying to create. So, and that takes attention to detail. So we really have to be focused on what's going on with our family. And we also have to learn ourselves so that we can understand the things that are going on. So when we're watching, paying attention, we're actually looking according to the law and the testimonies and the fruits of it so we can know what to do what to discuss and if we don't get do nothing without discretion go talk to that counselor that keeps the law about the situation to get the understanding needed to help ourselves and our family members amen continue to rock 42 and 10 please and when she is married least she should be barren he cares that she doesn't bear the reproach of being childless want her to be blessed to be fruitful and multiply as the children show the blessedness of a man's household continuing 42 and 9 please being married at least she should be hated he still cares for her well-being when she's married that she's being treated right too Seeing a father's care for his daughter's well-being and how what a daughter does can dishonor her father, a daughter ought to honor her parents and listen to her father that begot her, honoring him with her whole heart to keep the instructions learned from her youth or now that she's learning for many as some are newly coming into this so that she may incorporate it into her own children's lives. Okay. That part right there is real interesting. There's so many videos 
especially when it comes to like people that are more like traditional, like let's say like Hispanic families and stuff like that, that the mother or the father will have a certain expectation and then the daughter will know that expectation. And when the parents aren't around, she'll behave herself another way. And then when the parents come around, she'll whip up into shape. That's right there is something that will end up making the daughter be hated. Sorry, service. Right. In the heart. You're supposed to be the same person all the way around. And you're supposed to honor your parents. And she's not honoring her parents by doing contrary to them when they're not around. Well, sure, thank you. And we discussed that eye service that we want to stay away from in the last lesson in the foundations of the family. If you hadn't had the opportunity to check it out too. All right. So let's look over some of the standards for we know Yache deals with the inner man and not just the outside of the cup. So let's check into what he wants inside of us. Titus chapter 2 verse 4, please. That they may teach the young women to be sober. We're going to get into some definitions of things so we have good understanding of what we're getting into and what we're learning from Lord Yache. The definition of sober, G4994, it's to make of sound mind, that is figuratively, to discipline or correct to teach to be sober. Zachary, exactly. if you got anything, please do. All right. It says to make of a sound mind. It didn't say that she had to be of a sound mind. So that's a big difference. That's the parent's job. The parent's job is to make the daughter of a sound mind. That is to discipline or correct. So these are the two methods that are used to make the daughter of a sound mind. You have to teach her to be sober so we can understand. That's amazing. Accountability to help her be sound minded. If you read the their definition, it's going to give us more understanding of how we can help to make them sober. Their definition Restore one to his senses, to moderate, control, curb, disciple, to hold one to his duty, to admonish, to exhort earnestly. So if one, if there's something that you taught your child or your daughter, and they walked away from what you instructed them, you will restore one to their senses. You'll say, hey, remember. Remember what you're supposed to do, right? To moderate, control, curb, or disciple. So that's what the parent is supposed to do. The parent is supposed to moderate the environment or moderate the, the behavior of the child. That's why it says control or curb. So you would literally, when you see them going away from what's right, you would curb them. You would steer them back in the right direction to hold one to his duty so you would hold that child accountable. You can't just say, oh, they're just a child. The child has to be held to a standard of accountability. Other than that, you're working backwards. Because if you don't hold the child to an accountability and you let them have their way when they're young, you're literally going to be trying to backtrack when they get older, trying to fix the things that you've allowed them to have their way in. So that doesn't make sense. Um, to admonish, to exhort earnestly. And that's the parent's job, to admonish and exhort them on what's right and what they're supposed to be doing. Right. So that all of that helps them and teaches them to be sober and to, and to have a sound mind. Right. All right. Continuing and understanding the standards for teaching our daughters. 
Can you continue reading that Titus verse, please? Verse 4. To love their husbands. To love their husbands. G5362. Fond of man. That is, affectionate as a wife. Love their husbands. The definition of fond is having an affection or liking for. So as you can probably already see, this is essential for teaching a daughter to have fondness for a man and affection as a wife. Because we already know from the last lesson what that demon Asmodeus is seeking to do to daughters from their virginity. So helping her gain that affection and fondness and liking for a man is going to help her uphold the faith when she becomes a wife, if Elohim wills. I can tell you, Casa, one thing that plays against this in modern day society is either the father or the mother gives the daughter a bad depiction of men by saying, all men want is one thing. You have to watch out for this. They know, they're no good. They're this and that. When you start painting that picture of, of, men or boys her age and you create that to be the uh the image of a man other than the father because that's not how the father is portrayed in most cases or it is how the father is portrayed in some cases when it comes to a bitter a bitter mother mm -hmm. that all men are, are no good so that creates that that disdain for men and then your daughter grows up not trusting or not being willing to be fond or love or or have love for a man or have affection or liking toward them so you can see how that actually plays out by the household or the environment that the daughter is raised in it's true. It's, um, like they talked about, we sacrifice our kids to the errors of our hearts, teaching them our perspectives that aren't according to Allah Hayim's. Thank you for that. Continue that verse, please. To love their children. G5388. Fond of one's children, that is maternal, love their children. That's major too. It was some lesson we discussed where that was a part of the struggle in the world today where mothers, I think it was in a women's series where mothers lost the love for their children, where they wouldn't even want to nurse their children themselves to breastfeed them and things like that. And of course, we could understand the importance of having that love, that affection for a child. It matters, you know. It helps them develop affection for others, having had affection for themselves. Many of cases, the this not being implemented in the heart of the parent leads the child to end up having um, mental health issues because that fondness, remember, fond is having an affection or liking for. So if you're in an environment where your parent is only fond of you when you're doing what they desire for you to do, um, when you're only received when you're doing something that is well in their eyes, then that creates that that lack of maternal support. So we're supposed to be fond of our children. That means that we're actually supposed to like our children, not just be their parents or their father or their mother. We're supposed to like them and we're supposed to build them up 
for them to be someone that we love. And that's our job as parents. That's why I said love their children. We're supposed to build them up to be a person that we love. And if we're not building the child up to be a person that we love and we want to be around, then we're not doing something right. Right. It puts the it puts the 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 fruits or the precepts together. I'm just gonna say that he that teaches his son grieveth the enemy. Right. So it helps understand is not just teaching the child. You have to have affection for the child too. You have to have that liking for them from the get go to be in the right spirit to teach them to grieve the enemy because you're going to lead them aright as opposed to hating them, being embittered with them, which are spirits of the enemy. You're not going to be able to teach them in the way Allah Hayyam wants them to be taught so that they could grow into a person that will serve Allah Hayyam. So, got to have correct. a, yeah, we got to be the law and the fruits in what we're doing. And that starts with the parent. Because in this sense, the parent is the root and the child, <laughs> the child is the fruit of the tree. So if the root in the tree is, is, um, what's the word, Casa? Is rotten, then the fruit's going to be rotten. So we have to make sure as parents that our tree isn't rotted that our tree is live and vibrant, that we're actually walking in the fruits of the spirit ourselves, not walking in the works of the flesh, actually keeping the commandments ourselves, which is that part is actually coming up later in the lesson, that we have to walk it and be the example for our children to have an example. I'm not going to go too much into it because we're actually going to go into it pretty um, detailed. That's essential. And we touched that on the foundations in the last lesson about a man struggling with obeying the Lord is going to affect his family. Let's continue in Titus 2 and 5, please. To be discreet. This is G4998. Safe in mind, sound in mind. That is, self-controlled, moderate as to opinion or passion, discreet, sober, temperate. This is interesting from where Paul started, where you have to help the daughter by the admonitions given to be sober. You have to teach her affection for a man, fondness for a man, love for her husband, teach her to have affection for her children. These are things that are going to help her walk in her faith in her mind. And it's going to make her discreet. She's going to have that understanding to be sound of mind and, and moderate as to her opinion and passions, gaining that control of her emotions, being temperate, you know, cleaving to her father or to her husband to help her be discreet in all her works, doing everything according to the fruits and the laws helping in this interest in moderate as to opinion and this is a woman who's not opinionated where she has her own mind but she's already been taught from her youth to be subject to her father subject to her parents so she's already comfortable listening to her husband going to her husband for understanding because she's moderate as to her own opinion. She knows the process. Let me go get my counseling. Let me cleave to my husband and go through my due process to make sure I'm of the right mind in what I'm doing or what I'm feeling. Just building up.
And you shit. see, it says uh, moderate as to opinion or passion. Mm -hmm. You see those things are right next to each other because usually um, to be discreet, she has to be self-controlled in her passions. And that's what you're, you're supposed to teach your daughter to be self-controlled in her passions, not to be given over to her emotions. That's why if you read the Thayer's definition, it's going to actually go further into it. The Thayer definition of a sound mind, sane in one's senses, curbing one's desires and impulses, self-controlled, temperate. Right. Now, for many of us, even the parents, it's good to learn these things that you should have learned from your youth. And now you can learn them now so that you can actually learn them. And a lot of you guys are going to be learning with your daughters. And that's just the reality. Praise Allah and forward because you get to learn. But of a sound mind, sane in one senses. That means you're not overtaken by your emotions. Curbing one's desires. So just like we were talking about curbing when, you, when you're going off or out of the way, bringing yourself back. Curbing one's desires and impulses. So it may be your impulse to get vexed or to get frustrated. You actually have to curb that impulse. It may be your impulse to get angry. It may be your impulse to raise your voice. This is where curbing one's desires and impulses or desires even, if it's something that you want, being able to curb it and not getting emotional because you can't get what you want by going into any manipulation tactics because you can't get what you want. Being self-controlled and temperate, not allowing your emotions or your desires or your impulses to have control over you or your own opinion, which is your own desires. Thank you. This is essential and good. Praise Allah for this here. Let's continue in the edification, please. Chast. G53. Properly clean. That is figuratively innocent, modest, perfect, chaste, clean, or chast, clean, pure. Here we see again. Paul was walking us through the process. You help your daughter to curb her desires and impulses. You're freeing her from idols. You're purifying her mind. Because she won't be easily influenced by idols in that way. It's going to make her innocent before Allah Hayyam. Modest in her manner, her mindset, the way she carries herself the way she dresses and make her perfect before Allah I am, who you're preparing her to serve. If you will, Zachary, if you don't have anything, I'll continue. If you can read the Thayer's, I'll jump in. Okay. The Thayer definition, exciting reverence, venerable, sacred, pure, pure from carnality, chaste, modest, pure from every fault, immaculate, clean. I'm going to go first. I just said what I was saying. It seems like, please take the floor. <laughs> I seen your voice go high on that one part, so I figured you wanted to touch it. <laughs> I was like, ooh. I was like, oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> go ahead, though. <laughs> It says pure from carnality. And I thought that was the most important point because if you are pure from the works of the flesh, then you're going to be walking in the fruits of the spirit. And the works of the flesh are carnal. That's why it's the works of the flesh. That's why if you if you're teaching your daughter all of these good and righteous things, the fruits of the spirit how she's supposed to operate, how you're teaching her how to be clean and pure and modest and self-controlled. 
then you're teaching her how to be pure from every fault. Protecting her, washing her by the word that she may be blameless. Continue when you're ready, please. Keepers at home. And this is good. Keepers at home. G3626. A guard. Beware. Stay at home. That is domestically inclined. A good housekeeper. Keeper at home. This is interesting. Because your father's guiding you with his eye. He's watching. He's teaching his wife to watch. And you're watching your mother watching. <laughs> and then you're going to be learning to watch. You're going to become domestically inclined, on guard, wanting to be at home, keeping watch of your house, right. wa watching your children. That's going to be your your focus. Like, me, I want to know what's going on in my family. I want to take care of my family. You're aware of what's going on out there. You know what you've had to come through for yourself to overcome? Read the Thayer definition. Okay. Thayer's definition, caring for the house. Working at home, the watch of the house or keeper of the house, keeping at home and taking care of household affairs, a domestic. Go ahead, if you will. So you're teaching your daughter to be a good housekeeper. You're teaching her how to guard the house from any danger that could come upon the family, whether spiritual or carnal. You're teaching her how to upkeep the house because she's caring for the house. She's working at home, and her work is with the family and the house. She she takes care of what the man builds. So that's her job. That's her work. So keeping the house looking nice, keeping the children and building the children up in righteousness and the admonitions of Elohim. Being and walking in it herself so that she's a, an example of the house. Because if she's learning to clean the inside of the house and the house isn't clean. And it's not well maintained, then that's pretty much a figure of what's going on within her. It's a reflection of herself. And her not cleaning the inside of herself, the inside of the cup of herself. Because she's not learning to pay attention to detail. Or she's lazy. Gotcha. Because if she's not paying attention to detail and she's not cleaning and making sure that everything gets well and presented, then that means that She's not making sure everything is well and presented to Elohim either. Because if she's not taking care of the carnal things that a man has built and set up for her, how can she take care of the thing that Elohim built and set up for her, which is her vessel? Because she has to clean that the same way that she has to clean the house for the man. It's a similitude. That's right. That's why you see the fruits of it manifesting and what's going on. Right. So you can see how important it is that Elohim is saying that she has to be a keeper at home and the things that go into being a keeper at home actually teaches her to pay attention to detail. Elohim gives the work that's fit to help her. It's interesting, the humility of Elohim's ways. He said, through wisdom is a house builded. So you have to have a woman there to build a house. And 
the world a wise it. woman <laughs> yes <laughs> through wisdom <laughs> and for Allah I am a domestically inclined woman is good because it's a work he has her do to help build herself and build her family but society doesn't encourage a woman to be domestically inclined to stay at home and take care of her family or to take care of the house leading her away from the duty Allah Hayyam wants for her to help her grow hmm. and we get to see the fruits of it look at the fruits of the households look at these children nowadays and look at how they are in school and look at how they're treating the teachers and how they're treating their elders. Definitely seeing the fruits of the labors of today. Praise Allah for the understanding. And hope that's helpful for your sisters and fathers with raising your children and mothers with yourselves and raising your children this is good understanding to help us know what we need to do understand the tactics of the adversary and some of the things that may have not helped us growing up or in our perspectives that now we know of it we can go through our due processes of making repentance to Allah Hayyam, taking accountability and now putting in the work or seeking the guidance to know what work we need to put in to change our perspectives. Um, that was big too when you talked about some of us, you had mentioned this earlier, that some of us were learning to make these changes, we're learning to change with our children because we didn't learn these things at a young age. And I thought, Allah knows what he's doing because that also helps teach our children humility for them to see us go through the process of confessing faults, making the changes, putting in the work, implementing things to get better so that they can know you can do it too, you know? Okay. All right. If we can continue in Titus. Chapter 2, verse 5. We have the next portion there, please. Good. Good. G18. The Thea's definition is of good constitution or nature. Useful, salutary. Good, pleasant, agreeable, joyful, happy, excellent, distinguished, upright, Honorable. You're, you're teaching your daughter to be in the right spirit, to be joyful, to be happy. And you're also helping her learn her herself, like how she carries herself to be of good constitution or nature, like her mannerisms, her way of dealing, you're teaching her to be good in every respect so that she can do it for herself, her own salvation. And also when she has a family, she can lead them in the right way. Um, is that well? Yeah. Oh, right. Honest, honorable, right. Pleasant, agreeable, all of these words, useful. That means that she comes and helps. She's not lazy. Like, like when we start actually breaking down all of these words and the standard of Allah and how we're supposed to teach our children, it covers everything. It really shows us how we're supposed to be as a person. And this is the standard. And it puts the fathers, it puts us to a standard too. Because these children have to see it. So it's not just something to tell them, but we have to walk in it ourselves. Yeah, else we're going to be cast away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so.
Continue when you're ready, please. Obedient to their own husbands. This is G5293. I think his definition is to arrange under, to subordinate, to subject, put in subjection, to subject oneself, obey, to submit to one's control, to yield to one's admonition or advice, to obey, be subject. This here shows it's a choice you have to make for yourselves. And as a father, we have to teach our daughters to make because they have to submit themselves to the husband's control. They have to arrange themselves under him to subordinate themselves and put themselves in subjection under him. It's a choice to yield to his admonition and his advice, to curb that passion, to go contrary to him, but to yield yourselves unto Allah and his will to be subject unto your own husband. Zakwa, if you will. I thought that was good. That the word of Allah be not blasphemed. Look at what you're doing by just doing that. And what we just discussed, that process from going from learning to be sober, learning to have that moderation, and then going through the steps to become that pure woman, that discreet, that chaste and good woman, and then holding yourself to that accountability in Allah Hayyam by staying in subjection to your husband like he commanded. You're exalting the word of Allah Hayyam, Yache himself. You're exalting our holy parents so that the enemy can't blaspheme. Right. So hopefully that helps for daughters, and giving them the right perspective and upbringing, even though they may be adults now, still young in the faith. So hopefully it helps. What about your young men? Where do you go with your sons? What, you, what should mothers and fathers be teaching their sons? Continue in Titus 2 and 6, please. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness. So you see, what we went through for a daughter, and then that simple focus for teaching for when your son is a young man, I mean, he's a man of age, okay? Those simple things is going to show you fathers and mothers, it's going to show you having a pattern of good works because you're going to be walking in the things you're teaching and in doctrine, you're going to show uncorruptness because you're doing the things Allah Hayyam asks you to do. The word uncorruptness is G90. Incorruptibleness, that is figuratively purity of doctrine. So it's interesting, Dan spake of how Christ would come teaching the law of Allah through his works. And here we see his apostles were teaching us how to teach the law, how to show forth good doctrine by how we're operating and what we're doing, what we're encouraging our family unto by our works and the things that we're exhorting them or encouraging them onto. So we could really exemplify Allah Hayyam and show in the their definition says incorruptibility, soundness, integrity of mind. All of this shows that we're in the right mind with Allah Hayyam. He's in our thoughts. Okay. If you will, Zakwa. I thought it was very interesting. As soon as they touched on the young men, it says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So you exhort them the same way as the women, as the daughters to, in sober-mindedness. But then it goes straight and says, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing uncorruptness. It went straight to you being an example for them. Because men 
we are watching. You can say one thing, but we're watching what you're doing. Where daughters sometimes are a little bit more naive and gullible, they will listen to what you actually have to say, and they're not really watching what you're doing like that. But men, we're watching you like a hawk. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> I'm just laughing. Like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> we be on it. <laughs> Got it. So, when it comes to the men in your household, the young men in your household, you actually have to be that example because if you're not, they're gonna go out of the way. And you have to keep the commandments. You have to bear the fruits of the spirit. And doctrine showing uncorruptness. You can't show any corruptness in your walk and your belief. If the Bayer definition says incorruptibility, soundness, integrity of mind. Like, you have to walk in all integrity, doing everything that you're saying for them to do. Got to keep out of the hypocrisy and perfect everything. It's really interesting. Can you read the next word, the next part, please? Gravity. It's interesting seeing the, the seriousness of it for men. And then, then he goes right into gravity. And gravity means serious, seriousness, or solemnity of manner. So this is important to take everything that we're embarking on serious and not as a light matter so that our sons and daughters can understand the seriousness of what we're doing, the seriousness of the fear of Allah Hayyim. G4587, this is gravity, venerableness, that is probity, gravity, honesty. Okay, uh, venerableness, that's according to a great deal of respect, especially because of age, wisdom, or character. So you're teaching them to have a lot of respect for someone that's operating in a good character and that teaches them to operate in a good character to have gravity to be honest probity is the quality of having strong moral principles honesty and decency So you're teaching them to be all right. And to respect others. Now these things, you're also teaching the daughters too. This isn't just for the men, the young men. It says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So you have to understand that we're teaching both still. Okay? This is for young men and daughters. Yes, sir. The next one is uh, sincerity. G861. 
incorruptibility. Generally, unending existence, figuratively, genuineness, immortality, incorruption, sincerity. Now, doesn't that put into perspective the power of being sincere and genuine? There's a life in it. There's a lahayim in it. So the better you can become this person that Allah is calling us to be genuinely and is authentically you, the closer you are to immortality. And you're teaching others to draw close to our immortality in Christ. Just by being sincere. The more sincere you are, the more incorruptible you can be. Because if I'm sincere in my work, so I'm sincere in what I'm doing or what I'm saying, I can't be swayed to go in the wrong direction. Yeah. Because I'm not being double-minded in the first place. Yeah. I'm being genuine. A great you got something else, Kansa, you want to keep going. I'm about to. The great lesson for working on that sincerity to get to that one man, um, flee from partiality. If you haven't had the opportunity to check it out. Let's continue in Titus two and eight, please. Sound speech. G fifty one ninety nine healthy that is well in body figuratively true in doctrine sound whole you see as we're making the change and we're aligning ourselves to Allah and his law and his fruits and his doctrine our speech will be sound based on what we're saying that's true in doctrine and it'll be it's it's healthy because the words in good doctrine are actually healing. So our sound speech will help heal others by speaking true doctrine sincerely and not being moved from it, so that our words and our actions are lying together, being one. To add that. to you, the yeah. oh, I'm sorry, cause you gave me a good pause on that one. Yeah, I thought you might want the Thayers, and I jumped too soon. Sorry. That's all good. <laughs> to add to what you were saying is that if we actually are walking in true doctrine, the words that we speak, the things that we say, are going to be according to the commandments, and keep us in that box to speak things that are righteous and holy and good because one the scripture says let no corrupt communication come forth out of thy mouth let thy words be seasoned with salt the fruits of the spirit gentle kind temperate if we're actually walking in sound doctrine, our speech is going to change. The way we communicate with one another is going to be more healthy and not toxic. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be more loving and not full of hatred or undertone of hatred or anger or hostility. So the, the doctrine actually will start changing our speech. Amen. And this is where the Thayer definition come in. Go ahead, Casa. <laughs> <laughs> Thayer definition. <laughs> sound. Of a man who is sound in body to make one whole. 
restore him to health, metaphorically, teaching which does not deviate from the truth. So if a man starts walking in the commandments and the wisdom of Allah and the fruits of the spirit, he's a man who is sound in body and it makes him whole and restores him to health that he may live unto Allah Power of the truth. Power of true doctrine healing us by the word. healing us from the world and the spirits of it. Mm -hmm. True doctrine. True doctrine will heal us from the world and the spirits of it. It's interesting that I'm sure brothers and sisters that have been taking the time to spend with us and going through the lessons and such when you talked about, you can see the change in your speech, how true doctrine changes you. I'm sure people can attest for themselves how they how they can see their mannerisms changing the way they talk and things like that. So hopefully that helps to know, like, you know, you talk about taking the small victories, you know, see the growth in yourself, see the things change and, like, be encouraged you're getting somewhere. And of course, Nalaheim's time and, Amen. Being sincere, being sound in speech, letting everything be in doctrine and according to doctrine and set in good doctrine. What does that do? My man, continue, please. That cannot be condemned. He that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. You bring people to repentance by that. If we talked about how men, notice it says he, men are watching. We're paying attention to see what's going on. And when there's no fault to find, then they'll consider like, let me find out what's going on here. And let me check into this. It's interesting how well it, it it definitely works for women because mm -hmm. women have the tendency of of looking at others and not looking at themselves so that's where it comes into play where it said for a woman to be a keeper at home or keeper of the house she actually has to pay attention to herself and what's going on within that house so Allah knows yeah, yeah. True. And you get to see that both people play part, man and woman. Because a man, if he's uncorrupt in doctrine and doing everything that we just covered for the men, he's going to cause people not to have anything to say. And then for the woman, if she's chaste, obedient to her husband, she's going to convert those that are one without the word. So you see how it truly beautifies the spirit before Allah and men when a husband and wife agree together in sound, true doctrine. They turn the world unto Allah Hayyam. So. It takes two to make a thing go right. <laughs> yes, it does. So I had the song to just play it right there. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. We know whose master is ours. We know whose servant we are. We got to please Yache in all things. Well, we have to please him well, not answering again, which is G483, to dispute, refuse, answer again, contradict, deny, gainsay, or gainsayer, speak against. This touches back to where we 
we're talking in the fruits of first fruit lesson about being willing and obedient right at the end. In order to be obedient to our master, Yache, and to please him and please our Lahayim in all things, we have to truly not dispute his doctrine, dispute what he commands to do, not give in to, Paul said, um, murmurs and disputing. We have to not do that. So we can't answer again as he commands us. And if we find ourselves doing it, that's something we got to work on to be willing and obedient to what he wants us to do in the first place. Okay. I'm not speaking. You can also apply that to your parents. Because Elohim gave your parents to be a master over you. Because your parents control you. So when they ask you to do something or they require something of you, it's not well to dispute or refuse or to answer again, or to contradict what they're saying, or to speak against it. So right. it, it teaches you obedience, because answering again is an obedient, it's rebellious. Amen. Because we ought to be serving our parents as unto our masters, don't through our fear of the Lord. Continuing 2 and 10, please. Not purloining. Purloining is G3557. Apart or clandestinely. To sequestrate for oneself. That is, embezzle. Keep back. Purloin. That's essentially describing like keeping back something for ourselves. Not being sincere and genuine what we're doing, but looking out for ourselves, trying to get our own part in something. Double-minded. Yes, sir. Right. So he's telling us not to be double-minded, seeking to embezzle something. Because when you embezzle something, you're keeping a part of it. So you may do something for somebody, but there's a part in it for you. So you keep that, you embezzle that part. And what happens is, is you create a pattern where you only do things if you're getting something out of it. And it's not sincere. So you can see why this is stated in this verse to actually keep us from a spirit of greed or a spirit of envy so that we don't fall into that later. You have the um, Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira's wife. An example of keeping back part for themselves. All right, continuing. You ready? But showing all good fidelity that's faithfulness. We essentially got an understanding of what being faithful to Allah is to what we've been discussing thus far. And what does that do? Continue, please. That they may adorn the doctrine of Allah our Savior in all things. We clothe ourselves in Allah faithfulness. If we walk in all the things we've been talking about, continue, please. For the grace of Allah that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying unholiness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and holy in this present world. As Zachwa said, this is bringing us out of the world and helps us understand the grace that Allah brought forth and the salvation that he made appear to us all was for us to walk in the things we've been talking about so that we may deny unholiness and worldly lust and that we would actually be living soberly, righteously, and holy in the present world so that that light of Christ may actually shine forth for our salvation and to help others come to the light. Mm -hmm. 
and it's possible or he wanna ask us to do it. So yeah. Yeah. Mm. all right that was really good now that we have the basis of what to instruct and teach our daughters and children Let's continue to understand what more is needed for their edification and growth. Can you read Sirach 7 and 27, please? Honor thy father with thy whole heart, and forget not the sorrows of thy mother. Remember that thou wast begotten of them, and how canst thou recompense them the things that they have done for thee? Let that fact be a foundational reason to honor them. We got a reason to let go of whatever trauma may have happened growing up or in our adulthood so that we can have peace with our parents. Can you read Sirach 28 verse 2 and then 6 to 7, please? Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. So shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Sirach 28 and 6. Remember thy end, and let enmity cease. Remember corruption and death, and abide in the commandments. Remember the commandments, and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Remember the covenant of the highest, and wink at ignorance. This is essential. We got to take the time to really sit down and reason, process, whatever it was that transpired, whatever it may be that's hindering us from having peace in our hearts, firstly, with what was and what may be at the moment. And these admonitions are essential for getting past these things, to know that I need to forgive my neighbor for the hurt that was done to me so that I can be forgiven when I pray. I need to let that enmity cease and remember corruption and death that it can happen to all of us and death is appointed for all of us naturally so that I need to abide in the commandments so that I might have life regardless of what transpired and not bear malice remembering the covenant of Elohim to wink at ignorance get understanding that whatever that person did interesting let me get the precept after whatever that person did it was done in ignorance they don't understand what they're doing when overtaken by spirits people don't really understand it because we touched on in the pride lesson how when people die is then they realize, like, man, had I would have known what I was doing, I'd have done no other business but what was right to Allah. I am. So I understand it's people really are struggling and overtaken with the things that they do. And uh, Peter touched on this. Y'all remember we talked about how we're not supposed to call people a fool, right? Or we'll be in danger of the hellfire and things like that. Hear what Peter said in the Acts of Peter, this chapter 28, after they were getting ready to burn Peter, after a magician had did a trick with a dead body to make the people think he had powers and that Peter was a false prophet. And the people said they were going to burn Peter for that. And when they were gathering wood and torches to burn Peter, hear what Peter said. But Peter, receiving strength of Christ, now, this is the strength of Christ strengthening him not to get into his feelings about it and to have compassion on the people and see with a right lens. Lifted up his voice and said unto them that cried out against him. So these are people who are seeking to do harm to him. Now see I, ye people of Rome, that ye are, I must not say fools in vain, so long as your eyes and your ears and your hearts are blinded. He understood these people can't actually see. So understand 
Whatever hurt or harm that was done in the past, this person couldn't see truly what they were doing. And rather forgive them and hopefully Allah him strengthen them to come out of it to repent for themselves before it's too late. You know? We need that to be able to move forward for ourselves. If you have anything on that, Zakwa. No, I thought it was well spoken. Now, the man is the head of the woman. So as listening to the right admonitions of a father is essential for daughters. Can you read Proverbs 23, verse 22, please? Hearken unto thy father that begot thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Hopefully that helps for daughters building with their fathers. Now we're going to get into some different scenarios that come to pass in life. For daughters whose father may have died, and another man stepped in as a father unto you, and a husband to your mother. Sirach 4 and 10, please. Be as a father unto the fatherless, and instead of an husband unto their mother, so shalt thou be as the son of the Most High, and he shall love thee more than thy mother doeth. Allah loves him for it, and you should love him and honor him as your father too. Though he is not your father that begat you, he is your father through marriage. Asher has a daughter from the scenario where her father had died to understand how, through marriage, she is now his daughter. Can you read Jasher 45, verse 14 to 17, please? And the young woman was of a comely appearance, and a woman of sense, and she had been the wife of Malkiel, the son of Elam, the son of Shem. And Hadora bare a daughter unto Malkiel, and he called her name Serach. And Malkiel died after this, and Hadora went and remained in her father's house. And after the death of the wife of Asher, he went and took Hadora for a wife, and brought her to the land of Canaan. And he also brought with them Serach, her daughter, and she was three years old, and the damsel was brought up in Jacob's house. And the damsel was of a comely appearance, and she went in the sanctified ways of the children of Jacob. She lacked nothing, and Ahiah gave her wisdom and understanding. And then you see children of Abraham through faith from old time. The daughter was a Persian by blood, but through the death of her father, marriage, she was counted under the house of Jacob, walking in the ways of the children of Jacob. And remember, we talked about choice. Children have to choose the way they want to go. And you see the young daughter chose to go in the ways of the children of Jacob through the father Allah Hayyam placed in her life. So the man of understanding whom Allah Hayyam provided to be as a father and a husband is from the Most High. And you should honor him as a father though you were not begotten of him, per se. Nonetheless, he is begetting you anew in the faith, leading you unto Allah Hayyam. Can you read 1 Corinthians 4 and 15, please? But though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Yache I have begotten you through the gospel. So that man who is leading you children in the right direction is a father unto you through the gospel in Christ Yache, though he isn't your biological father. All right. Now, there are some whose father is, unfortunately, worse than an infidel, not providing for his own. Can you read 1 Timothy 5 and 8, please? But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He's still your father that begat you. So honor him and forgive him the hurt that it may have caused you being absent from you. Now, there may be another man who has been as a father to you, 
and a husband to your mother. Honor him and follow his guidance in the faith, as he is your father through marriage, whom the Lord has given you and your mother to have in his care. And we're going into the law to see how that works. Exodus 21 and 4, please. If his master had given him a wife, and she had borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. So, the Lord can remove a man out of the mother and children's lives if the man departs from serving him, and the Lord can give that household to another who will do his service and take care of the family. Going to touch on some different family scenarios, okay? Your in laws, your in law parents, or your parents in law, or your parents through marriage to their child. Can you read Tobit 10 and 12, please? And he said to his daughter, Honor thy father and thy mother in law, which are now thy parents, that I may hear a good report of thee. And he kissed her. Okay, so we see that in scripture. Now, step parents or foster parents when someone's fatherless or lost a parent when a father dies his wife is widowed and the child is fatherless then when the widow remarries the husband is the child's father as we just read about that's what transpired with asher and hadura and sirach and we can look in the scriptures to see that she was considered Asher's daughter from that point on. We had read Joshua 45 and 15 and 16. Can you read Joshua 54 and 92, please? And they went along until they came nigh unto their houses, and they found Sarak, the daughter of Asher, going forth to meet them. So through marriage of the widow, her child Sarak was Asher's daughter, counted under the house of Jacob. Verse 98, please. And Jacob blessed Sarak when she spoke these words before him. And he said unto her, My daughter, may death never prevail over thee, for thou hast revived my spirit. Only speak yet before me as thou hast spoken, for thou hast gladdened me with all thy words. So there you see through scripture. She was truly a part of their family, even Jacob's daughter and considered Asher's daughter too. And you can read through the testimonies like Numbers 26 and 46 to see that it was speaking of that same girl and Genesis 46 and 17. Now, when, when a mother takes another spouse besides your father that begot you, that's your mother's spouse. Going to, there's a different scenario now. In that first scenario with the step or foster parent, your father had died or your parent had died. This is when your parents are not dead. Okay. When a mother takes another spouse besides your father that begot you, that's your mother's spouse. Not your father too. If your father that begot you didn't leave you fatherless as an infidel or pass away. It goes the same if the scenario was of a mother instead. Okay? Can you read Leviticus 18 and 8, please? The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover, but if thy father's nakedness. So you see in the law, when your father has another spouse that's not your mother, that's your father's wife. It's not your mother. So long as your mother didn't leave you motherless as an infidel, or she didn't pass away. Okay. Now, getting into blended families. As this is what's going on in the world today. So get to talk about it to get some understanding of what the calling is for us if we happen to be in this environment. When a father is still alive and in their child's life, though divorced from the mother, that is still your father that begot you and is due honor for that reason and because he's not forsaking you to leave you fatherless as Sirach 7 and 27 and 28 or Proverbs 23 and 22 speaks of not being in your life. 
Now, he and your mother may have separated, and they should have remained alone to give whomever did the wrong an opportunity to repent and be reconciled with one another. Or other scenarios where one parent may have left in unbelief. Unfortunately, they didn't both walk as believers, and one or both of them may have remarried someone else, which put them both in transgression. And now you're in a blended family where you have your parents and then their respective spouses. For you, the child, if your father didn't forsake you to leave you fatherless, then hearken to your father that begot you, like the scriptures say, as he is your father. Now the man whom your mother may have married is her husband, so respect him as we ought to respect our elders. Yet he's not your father, having dominion over you too, since you're not fatherless, because your father that begot you is still in your life and provides for you as a man of faith does. Can you read First Peter 5 and 5, please? Yes. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Submit yourselves to your mother's spouse in respect and humility as an elder, though it's not your father. Continue, please. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. That showing humility even in a tough environment of having a blended family. Continue, please. For Elohim resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You don't want to get lifted up against your parent's spouse just because it's not your parent or angry at their enforcement trying to gain authority over you. Yes, you do listen to your parent in the Lord that begot you first and foremost, but you also show humility towards your other parent's spouse and communicate in meekness when you cannot do something they're asking out of reverence for your parent that begot you. Staying humble in the uncomfortable environment of a blended family will get you grace from Elohim. Uh, can you read verse 6, please? Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of Elohim, that he may exalt you in due time. And in due time... You will be exalted from the growth and the fruits of the Spirit from the experience. Continue, please. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. It can really be tough in these blended family environments. So be sure to cast your care onto Elohim, staying out of your emotions or curbing your passions, as we talked about. And Making your prayer and supplication unto Elohim with whatever may come up or may be troubling you, and keep the faith, understanding it's all a trial and the adversary is trying to turn you away. Continue, please. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So hold fast to the faith and stay in the spirits Elohim has called us unto. We aren't the only ones in these scenarios, as our brethren are going through like afflictions in the world. Okay. Hopefully it helps for understanding and motivation to do us right, no matter what environment we, we may be in. Or come from. Do you have anything else for that? Um, just those scenarios can be flip flopped. Um, if it's the father's spouse or the mother's spouse, it's the same thing. So. All right. Let's get into mother daughter relationships. All right. Now, as for mother-daughter relationships, mothers should lead them in the way they should go so that they would not depart from the good things in the law that their fathers taught them to learn obedience as the law teaches in Genesis 3 and 16 
And then in Ephesians 5, to 24, that a woman ought to submit to her husband in everything, and he should rule over her. Also, teach her not to usurp authority over a man by honoring her father and her brothers, if she has them, to be under their guidance when they are of age. And when she becomes a young woman, continue to teach her to be sober, to love her husband, to love her children, to be discreet, chaste, a keeper at home, good, obedient to her own husband, so that the doctrine of Allah Hayyam be not blasphemed by another spirit entering into your daughter's thoughts to lead her not to fulfill the sound doctrine of the Lord. But this doctrine doesn't come without responsibilities. For the mother must be walking the admonitions of the Lord to be an example of a believer to the daughter, so that the daughter be not discouraged and see that it's possible and not hard. Let's look in the scripts for dynamics of mother-daughter relationships. A mother with her young daughter teaches her daughters the good things in the law firstly by her own manner of living and behavior. In Titus 2 and 3, please. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior hath become with holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, Mother first needs to grow and set an example of a believer herself, to be in behavior, becoming of holiness, keeping the laws, and bringing forth the fruits of it. Continue, please. Teachers of good things. She should teach her young children good things in the law and testimonies, guiding her house, not only by her words, but by her conduct, being an example of guarding her emotions for the daughter to have an example of how to deal with situations. Now, when her daughter gets older, or she comes across other young women, when she teaches young women, she should teach specifically as commanded by the sound doctrine of the Lord. Titus 2, verse 4 to 5, please. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of Allah be not blasphemed. That's the things women hold each other accountable to and the direction they raise their young daughters to go in so that they do not depart when they are married. This means you all watch each other's back to support the furtherance of each other's faith by exhorting each other to be of the right mindset and do these things that Allah be not blasphemed whenever one of you may be going out of the way. For unmarried women, the teaching is 1 Corinthians 7 and 34, please. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, as she may please her husband. So, the general rule for sisters in the faith is... To be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, having a care for how they may please their husband, and if unmarried, have a care and focus on the Lord to be pure in mind and body, walking according to the law and the fruits of the Spirit. Make sure you go back over these words and understand for yourselves and help in one another. Then, anytime a sister or daughter is struggling or thinking to turn away from the sobriety of the rules of faith, show true love to restore her in the faith to the right thing, not suffering sin upon your sister. Can you read Leviticus 19 and 17, please? Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon them. So let's not hate one another by enabling sisters, or being unwilling to admonish one another, being a respect of persons. Rather, let's love and hold one another accountable, as we are not ignorant of the devil and his devices to enable us to stay in our sins out of his hatred for us. Can you read Romans 13 and 10, please? 
Love worketh no ill to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You see yourself going out of the way? Fulfill the law of love to moderate, control, or curb your passions and hold yourself to your duties in the faith. And if you see a sister going out of the way, restore her to her senses with exhortations and hold her to her duty as a woman, wife, and sister in the faith of Yache through admonishing and exhorting earnestly in love, gently and kindly. Anything else there, Zakwa? Oh, good to go. All right. Now, mothers to your young sons with sisters, right? Also for sons, when they are young, teach them to guide a woman according to the knowledge of the law <laughs> through being responsible for their sisters, teaching them how to be gentle, kind, and etc. So when they become young men, they will understand how a man ought to treat a woman as a sister in the faith with all purity. For further edification on raising kids, visit the website tabs under the Building the Family drop tab called The Hierarchy of the Household and Raising Children in Righteousness and Admonition to Children. Also reference the last couple of lessons here on foundations for the family and such for understanding. Now, in regards to a brother's relationship with his sister, a brother has power to lead his sister as it helps him learn responsibility for his family and his sister learns humility to submit to a man. The sons have power over their sister as well. Even as Yache, the son of Ahaya, has power over the twelve holy spirits, which are his sisters. Can you read Hermas Parable 9, chapter 13, verse 2, please? And these virgins, who are they? They, says he, are holy spirits. For these virgins are powers of the son of Elohim. If therefore thou bear the name, and bear not his power, thou shalt bear his name to none effect. So you see through scripture, Yache, giving us an understanding of how a brother has power over his sisters. One can confirm a son has power over his sister by evidence of him having authority to give her in marriage if the father is absent as well. Can you read Jubilees 30 and 7, please? And if there is any man who wisheth in Israel to give his daughter or his sister to any man who is of the seed of the Gentiles, he shall surely die. And they shall stone him with stones, for he hath wrought shame in Israel. We see a son has the authority to give his sister in marriage to understand a brother has power over his sister too. Okay. Just for clarity, you can visit the website. We got tabs on understanding marriage and all that for further edification on who the seed of the Gentile is. But real quick, the seed of the Gentile is any man of any nation who is not a son of Abraham through faith or by faith. Okay. That's what it's talking about. Cannot give our daughters to unbelievers. We'll be in trouble for that in the house of Israel. Okay. It's not talking about not giving them to people of another race, literally. Okay. Now, continuing in the edification. Continuing in the edification for sons and sister relationships. The sons protect and guide their sisters to obey their father by the instruction or wisdom of their mother and in obedience to that voice of their father, who is the head of the household. Now, the benefits of a righteous household for sons. The hierarchy of the family prepares the sons for adulthood and marriage. The son, having learned to honor his parents, being in subjection unto them, reciprocates that nurture and gentleness he experiences from them by guiding and protecting his sister or sisters. In the process, he learns to be patient and long-suffering with his sister, as he has seen his father do, and he learns to be delicate and affectionate as he has seen his mother do, all of which will prepare him to be a good husband in truth 
if the Lord wills for him to have a wife, because he will know how to love her as a sister first, having loved his own sister in righteousness by the example of his parents. So everyone being accountable for their own actions and holding Yache's standard as the standard for the household prepares everyone to walk uprightly in the commandments and fruits of the Spirit. Anything else there? No, nope, keep going, brother. Okay. Now, the benefits of a righteous household for daughters. This hierarchy is also a nurturing environment to prepare a daughter for adulthood and healthy marriage life because she learns to be shamefaced toward all men by the example of her mother's subjection and affection for her father, along with her own subjection and affinity to her father and her reverence with obedience to her brothers and her love for her brothers who look out for her. Serving her parents as her masters prepares her to be a helpmeet unto her husband. Her virtuous mother's example of not being idle, hardworking in business, and guiding her house in the fear of the Lord gives her an example of how to be virtuous as well. She also learns from her mother how to be faithful, chaste, gentle, good, discreet, loving, obedient, a keeper at home, and a teacher of good things to her own children in the future. I would even ask she learns from both parents how to keep an eye out, how to be diligent, pay attention to what's going on, as well as the son does too. In this environment, it also teaches a daughter not to usurp authority over a man, which would be a reproach unto her, as Sirach 22 and 5 and 42 and 10 and 1 Timothy 2 and 12 shows. The environment encourages her to walk in humility by honoring her father, mother, and brethren. This environment prepares her for marriage as she walks in humility and obedience towards her parents and siblings, understanding the love her brothers and parents have shown through guiding her on the right path, which will enable her to have a flourishing relationship with her husband, whom she will reverence as a brother firstly, having loved her brothers, and love affectionately as a wife, having learned from her mother's relationship with her father. Thus, parents working as one unit to raise their household together brings forth righteousness by being examples of believers to their children, showing them how to love and honor one another, just as Yache learned from the Father, the Holy Father, and wisdom, his true mother. Anything else there? Oh, good to go. All right. Now, touching on kids controlling their parents. It's not good. Can you read 1 Timothy 5 and 1, please? Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. So the word rebuke is G1969, to chastise, that is with words, to upbraid, rebuke. And then entreat is G3870, to call near, that is invite, invoke by imploration, hortation or consolation, beseech call for, be of good comfort, or comfort, desire, give exhortation, entreat, pray. We are not to seek to control our parents, to get them to do what we want them to do. As Zach Bob talked about earlier, how it's not for parents to seek to get their children to do what they want them to do or prepare them children for themselves is not for a child to seek to get their parents to do what they want them to do. It's everybody. It's a mutual relationship of everybody seeking to help one another serve Allah Hayyam, or hopeful to see each other serve Allah Hayyam. So we have to be mindful of not desiring to have that control over our parents or getting them to do what we want them to do understanding that everything is from Allah Hayyam and is good, whatever comes from him, 
because he knows what he's doing and he has everyone's best interests at heart. And also be mindful because that that desire can lead us to talk to our parents disrespectfully. To lead us, as it says, to, to chastise or to upbraid them with words as opposed to having a sincere desire for Allah Hayyam and what he wills to speak to us parents in the right way, to call near, an invite, you know, speaking words of comfort or exhortation. Um, if you got anything else on that, Zach, well, please. Be, um, I think that falls right into be discreet. Because if a child is learning to be discreet, they're learning to be safe in mind and self-controlled and to moderate their opinion or passions. So they wouldn't seek to manipulate or to control their parents, but instead they would be sincere. So they're actually learning the things that Allah Hayyam is teaching them and actually keep them away from those spirits that are trying to get them to have dominion over their parents. Praise Allah Hayyam. Now we went through Parent daughter, mother daughter. Let's go into parent son relationships. Let's look into that. Sirach three and two, please. For the Lord hath given the father honor over the children, and hath confirmed the authority of the mother over the sons. The definition of authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. So a mother has this authority over her sons when they are young. A father has honor over the children all their days. Yet a mother has authority over the sons while they are children. To guide them in the way they should go as their father commanded so that they would not depart. Can you read Proverbs 22 and 6 please? Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old... You will not depart from it. Right. That's what parents ought to do. As we learned thus far that both parents need to have a watchful eye as to what's going on in their family and also watch themselves to make sure they're doing what's right and teaching what's right so that their children may be trained up in the way to go and not depart from it. Having a non-hypocritical example in their life. So that's what a parent ought to do. Yet when that child becomes a young man, a woman ought not to usurp authority over a man to teach him. Can you read 1 Timothy 2 and 12, please? But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to absorb authority over the man, but to be in silence. Though a woman cannot teach a man, she can exhort him to be sober-minded. Titus 2 and 1, and then verse 6, please. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So a mother teaches her sons having authority over them in their youth. But when they become men, she ought not to assert authority over her sons to teach them. But she may exhort the young men to be sober-minded as a sister, because when a young man is no longer a child, he ought to be viewed by his mother as a brother rather than a son she has authority over. There is a shift in the dynamic of the relationship between a mother and a son as he becomes a man as well, seen as though a woman ought not to usurp authority over a man. As a man, his mother respects him as a brother and exhorts him unto good works as a young man. The precepts show a mother respects her son as a brother when he is a man. Can you read Tobit 10 and 12, please? 
And he said to his daughter, Honor thy father and thy mother-in-law, which are now thy parents. So in-laws become our parents through marriage to their children. Continue, please. That I may hear a good report of thee. And he kissed her. Now let's see how a mother views her son when he is an adult, though she is his mother. Continue, please. Edna also said to Tobias, The Lord of heaven restore thee, my dear brother. She didn't view him as beneath her or someone that she has authority over, but an equal, so as not to usurp authority over a man, though he is her son. Continue, please. And grant that I may see thy children of my daughter Sarah before I die, that I may rejoice before the Lord. As is fitting for a mother to do with young men, she also exhorted him unto good, and not giving an order or making a decision for him, but rather entreating him. Continue, please. Behold, I commit my daughter unto thee of special trust. Wherefore, do not entreat her evil. So you see, that's an example of a woman not usurping authority over a man, but exhorting him unto good without teaching him. Notice, she didn't seek to go into scriptures and teach him, but just exhorting him unto well-doing as a brother. Okay. Anything else there? Or we keep going. Um, no, that was good. Um, all right. So she didn't, she didn't make a decision for him. She didn't enforce. She just asked him and said, um, grant that I may see thy children. Right. So she wasn't saying, you make sure you bring these children over here to me. She said, she asked, grant that I may see thy children or my daughter Sarah before I die. You know, so she was definitely in humility. Thank you for that. Now getting into the dynamics of relationships between men and women. Now, women and mothers, when it comes to men or their sons who have grown into young men, women do not teach them, but exhort them as brothers as sound doctrine requires them to in support of the young men, as we saw the testimony of Edna and Tobias's relationship. Let's get in to understand how a woman exhorts a man as a brother. Titus 2 and 6, please. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. G49, 93. Sober-minded is, we touched on it earlier, to be of sound mind that is sane, figuratively, moderate. So exhort him to be sound-minded in moderation. And that's important because remember, spirit of jealousy seeks to cause a man to forget sobriety and moderation. So that exhortation in itself is major because if you can help a man stay out of the spirit of jealousy, you're helping him learn to stay out of fornication because jealousy dwells in all the lusts of fornication. Okay. Continuing. Be in right mind. Sober-minded, be sober, soberly. Okay. Uh, I'll read the Thayers, and if you got anything, please. To be in one's right mind. So exhort him to have a right mind, put in his heavenly parents first in all things, having the fear of Allah Hayyam in all his thoughts, to be humble. It goes on to say, to exercise self-control. So exhort him to practice self-control, keeping that sobriety and moderation so as not to fall into fornication's lust and jealousy. Also, it goes on to say, to put a moderate estimate upon oneself, think of oneself soberly. So exhort him to be humble and meek. And also, it says to curb one's passions. So exhort him to curb his passions, to keep the faith not being given over to his emotions. Okay. I'll continue if you don't have anything yet. I don't. You can go ahead, bro. Okay. 
Okay. Then now is the word is said, the young men likewise exhort to be sober binding. So let's understand exhort. Exhort is G3870. To call near, that is, invite, invoke, imploration, hortation, consolation, beseech, call for, be of good comfort, desire, give exhortation, exhort, entreat, pray. You notice with Edna, as Zach was talking about, she didn't impose a command or to like tell, uh, no, she didn't impose her any authority on Tobias in her discussion with them. She prayed. She said, may the Lord of heaven restore thee and grant that I may see the children. She was praying. She didn't tell him what to do. She put in, she mentioned what she wishes Elohim to do and also entreated him, invited him. Hey, I give you my daughter special trust. Wherefore, entreat her not evil. I said, she didn't assert herself over them. She didn't um, rebuke him or chastise him with words. This is not fit in the Lord. Okay. Entreat also means in the Thea definition to console, to encourage and strengthen by consolation, to comfort, to encourage, strengthen, Exhorting and comforting and encouraging. So you can see how exhorting young men, you're speaking words to help encourage them, console them to keep going or to come out of whatever's going on. Or you're strengthening them by your words to keep working, you know, to build them up, you know. If you don't have anything, Zach, well. No, that was good. Okay. Now, this type of woman that encourages young men in the faith with words of life to strengthen them is a special woman. Can you read Sirach 36 and 23, please? If there be kindness, meekness, and comfort in her tongue, then it's not her husband like other men. If you mothers and women in the faith are speaking life into the young men to encourage and strengthen them, you will show yourselves to be gifts of the Lord by your example of a loving woman with a well-instructed mind in the admonitions of the Lord. Can you read Sirach 26 and 14, please? Don't forget to do it to your husbands as well. For sure. A silent and loving woman it's a gift of the Lord, and there is nothing so much worth as a mind well instructed. A woman instructed in the ways of the law is invaluable, as she helps keep a man or build a man up in the faith, being in help to him with the kindness and love in her tongue, exhorting him unto good. On the other hand, the world teaches women to take down men, by not helping comfort them to press forward, seeking their own, and not the well-being of their husband, and unfortunately, their children, or other men, unfortunately too, sorry. Can you use Sirach 25 and 23, please? A wicked woman abateth the courage, maketh an heavy countenance and a wounded heart. A woman that would not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. She does this by how she speaks to him and treats him, as he may be working on overcoming something or struggling to overcome something, needing encouragement. Sirach 25 and 22, please. A woman, if she maintain her husband, is full of anger, impudence, and much reproach. Some men, after not being encouraged, dealing with a woman's anger and reproaches or her disrespect towards him, they leave or distance themselves from her for a peace of mind. As we have talked about in prior lessons, women are powerful. They can help a land prosper or fall to whoredom. They can help convert others by their manner of living, as Peter said, or lead them astray as it was women who even were able to lead astray, angels, as Reuben spake of. Here we see today, a woman's words and manner in which she speaks can help a man prosper 
strengthen him to, to keep working at overcoming or break him down to fall. Just to summarize thus far, we've seen in the precepts that help women and men understand the relationship shifts between mother and sons or men and women that a mother teaches her young sons since she is their mother and has authority over them as Sarah 3 and 2 speaks in their youth to instruct them and raise them up in the way that they should go as children so that they would not depart as Proverbs 22 and 6 talks about. Yet, when the sons are of age as young men, they are now men, and a woman ought not to usurp authority over them, as 2 Timothy 2 and 12 speaks of, to teach them, but rather, now she ought to view him as a brother, and exhort him to be sober-minded, and direct him to his father in the Lord, or holy men, ministering in the faith of Yache, who they know to keep the commands, as Sirach 37 and 12 speaks of, to teach them so that they may have the proper example of their mother or any woman keeping the commandments in the faith, not to teach or usurp authority over a man. Anything else there, Zachary? No, we can keep going. Okay. Let's see an example of this relationship dynamic shift in Scripture. As a man... Yache had authority to commit his mother unto another to help understand a mother is in her son's care as a sister unto her brother when he becomes a man. Can you read John 19 and 26 and 27, please? When Yache therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Though he was Mary's son in the flesh, he had authority as a brother to commit her unto John, his disciple. Even his mother in spirit, the Holy Spirit, he has authority given of his father to send her to dwell in men. Can you read John 15 and 26, please? But when the comforter is come, whom I was sent unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, she shall testify of me. Yet he still does righteousness in that he honored his Father to get the authority to send the Spirit, since his Father is still alive and the husband of the mother. John 14 and 16, please. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that she may abide with you forever. Thus we see a mother-son relationship dynamic changes as a son gets older to have authority over his mother as a sister, though she still exhorts him to do good works as a sister with her brother. Now this leads to the question, when does the dynamic shift happen? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Now, for a further understanding of the relationship dynamic changes between mother and son, from a child, we talked about a mother raises a son in the way that he should go. And that way is to put Allah in first in all things to fulfill his will. As a result, as a son is growing, he has to put Allah in first and then being subject to his parents come after. Can you read 4th Maccabees 2 and 10, please? For the law conquers even affection toward parents, not surrendering virtue on their account. Let's see an example in Christ who as a youth put Allah in first. Luke 2 and 41 to 43, please. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Yache tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. There you see, at 12, he was still considered a child, so his mother still had authority over him. Let's see what transpired when they found him. Jump to verse 48 to 49, please. And when they saw him, 
they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. A mother has authority over the sons in their youth, so she is handling the matter, though his father after the flesh is there as well. Continue, please. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? He didn't think they would be seeking for him. Instead felt they should have known he would be about the Father in Heaven's business, putting Allah high him first. Yet being a child, he submitted himself to his parents. Can you jump to verse 51, please? And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. So we see a son in subjection to his mother in his youth yet putting al -Hayim first in both instances. He was at the temple, honoring al -Hayim to be about his business. Then when his parents came looking for him, he was subject to them, honoring them, doing service as unto his masters, as al -Hayim commanded. Let's see what age is when a son becomes a young man, for the mother's-son relationship to shift to a brother-sister relationship. So, so far, we know it's not 12, as Yache was still considered a child at that age. So let's look into the testimonies and see. Can you read Apocalypse of Paul 16, please? And I heard the Lord Elohim, the just judge, again saying, Come, angel of this soul, and stand in the midst. And the angel of the sinful soul came, having in his hand a manuscript, and said, these, Lord, in my hands are all the sins of his soul from his youth till today. What is considered his youth? From the tenth year of his birth. From the tenth year is his youth, wherein his sins are written down. But when is he considered a young man, though? Continue, please. And if thou command, Lord... I will also relate his act from the beginning of his fifteenth year. And the Lord Allah I am the just judge said, I say unto thee, angel, I do not expect of thee an account of him since he began to be fifteen years old. At fifteen, he isn't a youth, but a young man, and accountable for his sins. So he is a child or a youth up until he begins to be fifteen years old. Then, he is a young man from his fifteenth year onward, and a woman ought not to usurp authority over him from that age, but to exhort him unto good as a sister would her brother. We can see at fifteen a son becomes a young man, in that Jacob and Esau went out into society on their own when they became fifteen years old too. Can you read Jasher 26 and 17, please? And the boys grew up in their fifteenth year, and they came amongst the society of men. Prior to that time, they were under their parents, essentially. But at fifteen, they ventured out on their own and chose for themselves what lifestyle they wanted to follow. Continue, please. Esau was a designing and deceitful man, and an expert hunter in the field. And Jacob was a man, perfect and wise, dwelling in tents feeding flocks and learning the instructions of Ahia and the commands of his father and mother. As a young man, we have the choice to learn the instructions of Ahia or not, and then we also have the choice to learn our parents' commands. A father teaches the commandments, but a mother exhorts on the matter in which one ought to fulfill the commands, as we discussed in prior lessons, so she isn't teaching as a father would. Can you read Proverbs 6 and 20, please? My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. That's essential for us, okay? Um, did you have anything about the age and before we continue? Nope, mm -mm. the age. 15 is when they become a quote-unquote man. Yeah. 
Seria isso. Keeping our father's commands and not forsaking the laws of our mother, as we talked about in the, um, what was it, honor and honest? I can't remember at this point. It's been a lot of lessons, but we talked about that stuff in one of these lessons. It's essential. Um, Sarat, three and six, please. He that honoreth his father shall have a long life. This is true, because that was the first promise to prolong our days. Continue, please. And he that is obedient unto the Lord shall be a comfort to his mother. A son in his youth would also comfort his mother through his obedience to the Lord, listening to her when she is teaching him the right things to do. When he gets older... As a young man, the relationship dynamic changes as women ought not to assert authority over a man to teach him. So in his obedience to the Lord, he would still be a comfort to his mother in taking heed to her exhortations to be sober-minded. Then to help her in her old age and help provide if she is a widow in the faith after making sure his wife and children are taken care of, of course. Though she doesn't have authority over him as an adult to teach him, give orders, or make decisions enforcing obedience, he is still a comfort to help her so long as it isn't something that would hinder him from being obedient to Allah Hayyam and hinder him from providing for his wife and children if he is married. A man has to be mindful not to try to extend himself beyond what he is able, lest he fall into poverty himself. Can you read Sirach 29 and 20, please? Help thy neighbor according to thy power, and beware that thou thyself fall not into the same. All right, Sirach 3 and 7, please. He that feareth the Lord will honor his father, and will do service unto his parents as to his masters. So for fear of the Lord, we serve our parents in the Lord as our masters. And if our parents aren't in the Lord, we honor them and serve them as our masters so long as the service doesn't prevent us from abiding in the fear of the Lord to keep his law first. Continue, please. Honor thy father and mother both in word and deed, that a blessing may come upon thee from them. As we talked about true dealings in the taking Allah Hayyam's name in vain lesson in the law class, let's be mindful to speak and do truth with our parents and be dependable to speak with deep respect in our words and fulfill our words so as not to be found liars not doing what we say we will do. So be sure to take time to speak honestly about what we can and can't do with our parents so as not to be found lacking in the sight of Allah Hayyam. Sirach 4 and 29, please. Be not hasty in thy tongue. And an ID is slack and remiss. Amen. If we are honorable in word and deed to do service as unto our masters, it will help build our own family up too. Can you read Sirach 3 and 9, please? For the blessing of the Father establish the houses of the children. Amen. As he has been given honor over the children by Allah Hayyam. All right? But the curse of the mother rooteth out foundations. Exactly. Let me understand this here. Yeah. Yache will not dwell where the mother is not honored, for Yache is the foundation of us all. For his commandment is honor thy father and mother. And if we don't uphold that, and we grieve our mother, and in her agony she curses us, Allah will hear. Okay. Matthew 15 and 4, please. You got an example of that with, with Esau. Um, Esau and um, Rebecca. When, yeah. When, yeah. A few situations with his parents, he didn't honor them. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 15 and 4. For Allah I am commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. 
that commandment is straightforward. So even if our parents are living outside of the boundaries of faith outlined in the commandments, it's not our place to judge them. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10, and then jump to 13, please. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. The world is full of people struggling with things, and it's not our place to judge folks like we can't be around them, as we don't know the end of their journey, lest we become judges of the law and evil speakers. Also, they have Allah Hayim as their own judge. Can you jump to verse 13, please? But them that are without Allah Hayim judgeth. Let Allah Hayim judge, knowing we are all in his hands. Have mercy and be compassionate for the struggles your parents face, not condemning them to not have anything to do with them. Luke chapter 6, verse 36 to 38, please. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. There are different struggles in the world that we all face, and some are overcome by them, while some, by Allah I am being gracious, are coming out of them. And we are here in this world to be understanding and long-suffering, knowing these facts to overcome evil through our faith in Allah I am. The more we judge others, show the lack of faith in ourselves and desire for control. Can you read Hermas Mandate 5, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, please? Be thou long-suffering and understanding, he saith. And thou shalt have the mastery over all evil deeds, and shalt work all righteousness. For if thou art long-suffering, the Holy Spirit that abideth in thee shall be pure, not being darkened by another evil spirit, but dwelling in a large room shall rejoice and be glad with the vessel in which she dwelleth, and shall serve Allah with much cheerfulness, having prosperity in herself. The Holy Spirit we see the way she operates. She isn't looking down on the world. She's long-suffering. Allah is long-suffering and understanding. So it truly will perfect our faith to be that with ourselves and with others, not designed to control them, but trusting Allah has got a process and whatever it is is for the best. You know, just hoping for the best for folks. If you don't have anything, continue, please. But long suffering is great and strong, and has a mighty and vigorous power, and is prosperous in great enlargement, gladsome, exultant, free from care, glorifying the Lord at every season, having no bitterness in itself, remaining always gentle and tranquil. This long suffering therefore dwelleth with those whose faith is perfect. Yeah. You see the freedom being long suffering also does for our mental health and our well being. We have to be at peace by whatever means that peace can be had with our parents in the world, understanding the struggles ourselves and not judging them as condemned like we can't be around them unless it's a situation where being apart is necessary for peace or safety, as we discuss in the Wisdom in Our Relationships lesson. In the next lesson, Lord willing, we will talk about love being our boundary in Christ in tough relationships, or any relationship. <laughs> Whew, anything else, Zachwell?
Hey man, I thought it was good. Um, I thought it was a good, a lot of good information, a lot of different variables, and it really kind of touches and puts everything in a perspective for all relationships and and all um households. So even with um your relationship with your husband and wife, um, it really does touch on everything and it puts everything in the proper perspective of Allah perspective. So, amen. Praise him for that. Praise him, praise him. Uh, we thank you all for taking this time to join us. We thank you all for the ones who continually join us. And for those who are new, we really appreciate you spending this time with us. And hopefully you'll be inspired to continue with us in this journey of faith and obedience to Yache Christ unto Ahaya, our Alahayim. And uh, hopefully we catch you on the next one. Anything else, Zakwa? Shalom. Shalom. Good to go. Peace. HRC, 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 HRC,